Hello and welcome to week four, part two of EGM 703, SAR applications. In this lesson, we'll look at a number of different scientific applications of SAR data. We'll start off by looking at how we can use SAR for monitoring different hazards, such as floods and wildfires. Then we'll move on to looking at how we can use SAR to observe surface displacements before we finish up with applications of oil spill and ship detection. So as we've seen from the week three practical, calm surface water tends to appear dark in a SAR image. The water's surface acts as a specular reflector and directs most of the signal away from the sensor. In the image that we see here, we have two different polarizations showing a flooded area. On the left, we have the VH polarization, in the middle, the VV polarization, and on the right, the derived flood extents from each of these two different images. This example is from a study that looked at flooding in the rivers Wharf and Ouse in northeast England during the winter 2015 to 2016. Of course, the presence of flood water is not the only reason that a pixel might appear dark, but if we compare images from before and during a flood, we can usually detect flood waters as pixels that become significantly darker. We do have to take some different things into consideration, for example, the sensor polarization. As we can see in the image up here and in the graph down here, there are differences in the flood detected area based on the sensor polarization. And in this example, the cross polarized signal tends to provide a higher estimate of flood area than the vertically polarized signal. We also need to consider things like the speckle, the random phase noise that is present in SAR images, so we normally want to make sure that we do some kind of filtering before we try to classify SAR images. Finally, we can also consider the terrain as this study did by considering only pixels that are likely to be flooded, i.e. not at the top of a mountain, we can cut down on the false classifications. In a bit of the opposite direction of flooding, burn scars tend to have a higher or a brighter backscatter than the surrounding areas. The example here shows a burn scar from a fire near Toke, Alaska. We can see that the unburned forest on the left and right sides of the images appears sort of gray, while the burn scar shows up very prominently brightly in the center. Now this happens because, in part because of a difference in soil moisture between burned and unburned areas. After the fire, we tend to see higher soil moisture due to the loss of vegetation such as sphagnum moss, but also the exposure of more rough areas. This depends on the wavelength of the sensor though. For example, this image is a C-band radar image. If we look at the same area in an L-band radar uh, using an L-band sensor, then we no longer see the enhanced backscatter of the burn scar that we see with the C-band. This signal is also seasonal. Depending on the time of year, the backscatter will be more or less enhanced, as shown as in this comparison of an image from May and from September 1992. We can also see how the effects can be very long-lasting, with burn scars from multiple fire years visible in the same area, including some as old as 13 years. If we have two or more images separated in time, and then we can observe slow surface motion, for example, the flow of landslides or of glaciers. So the basic idea of offset tracking is as follows. First, we start with a small subregion, also known as a template or a chip of the first image. And starting from that same location in the second image, we search for our reference template by moving it around the second image and calculating the correlation between the sample chips. The peak correlation generally corresponds to the surface displacement between the two images. With SAR images, we usually correlate using both components of the complex image. That is, we include the speckle, which is why you'll sometimes see this technique referred to as speckle tracking, at least in the SAR context. We normally use non-terrain non corrected images for this, so this technique gives us the displacement in both the range and azimuth directions. In order to transform this to ground coordinates, we have to geocode the offsets using a DEM. 
Repeat satellite images let us observe the motion of glaciers. For larger displacements, typically on the order of meters per day, we can use techniques like offset or speckle tracking. For smaller displacements on the order of centimeters per day, or potentially even smaller than that, we can use INSAR. We can also look at motion on different scales, starting from the scale of individual glaciers, like in this animation. This animation shows the onset of a surge at Morschnevbrenn Svalbard, and we can see that as the glacier starts to move faster, the surface becomes much brighter. This happens because the speed up actually causes the glacier to pull apart and crack, forming crevasses, which makes it even easier for us to observe the motion from space. We can also observe motion on the scale of ice sheets, like this velocity map for Antarctica from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. You can see how the scale varies from only a few meters per year, all the way up to over a thousand meters per year near the coasts. To be able to map both slow moving and fast moving regions, we have to combine approaches like INSAR or offset tracking. This is highlighted here for the Amory Ice Shelf region, where we can see slow moving and fast moving areas in very close proximity to each other. So when we use SAR images, we also get observations during the polar night or during night in other areas of the world, as well as through cloud cover, which is especially useful when we're studying glaciers that are located either at the poles or in very cloudy regions. In addition to changing the spectral reflectance of water, oil also dampens small surface waves, which are known as capillary waves, which changes the texture of the surface. In particular, it makes the surface appear much darker, which means that we can use SAR images to detect and observe oil spills. In these examples, we can see the oil spills highlighted as dark, smooth areas surrounded by somewhat brighter, more rough areas of water. And we can also see how this long streak down here is trailing behind a ship, which we can also see in the image. Oops. We do need to be careful about potential lookalikes. As with floodwaters, there can be other reasons for there to be dark, smooth areas in a SAR image. For example, some biogenic surface films, which are not human-caused oil spills, can change the texture of the water surface and therefore appear dark. Grease ice, one of the formation stages of sea ice, can cause a similar effect. And of course, we also have to have, we can also have calm, wind-free areas due to different wind patterns. All of these are different things to keep in mind when we're attempting to classify oil spills. As we saw on the previous slide, we can also use SAR images to detect ships. This probably makes some sense given the initial development of radar technology. Monitoring ships or maritime activity is important for things like monitoring fisheries, surveilling marine traffic, especially around ports, and also for safety operations. With higher resolution SAR images, we can also easily see ships. They show up very brightly since they're effectively large corner reflectors on a mostly dark background. In the example shown here from a 2019 study by Deshane et al., um, the authors used an artificial neural network to do both some simple classification, i.e. ship or no ship, as well as characterization, which is what kind of ship are we looking at? And as we can see, different kinds of ships have different signatures in the SAR image owing to their different overall shapes and profiles, and we can use this to map them in a particular SAR image. With multiple SAR images, we can look at the changes uh, in traffic over time. As we've seen in this lesson, there are a number of ways that applications of SAR, optical, hyperspectral, and thermal images overlap, and we can often use these different techniques in complementary ways. In general, SAR images are weather independent. We can make observations despite heavy cloud cover, or even at night, when we have no external source of illumination. Interpreting SAR images can be quite challenging, but we can still use a lot of the techniques that we've already studied to help us make sense of what it is that we're seeing. 
As always, I've included links to the different articles referenced in the presentation here. Uh, they're also available on the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions of the articles in the Zotero library. I've also added a few additional papers to the Zotero library that weren't covered here, so feel free to browse those as well. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!